All right, so the last time we were working on CBDB, uh, we were starting to set up the ability to save data to our database. We then took that uh, detour over to have uh, some lessons on JSON. And I think that's useful to uh, have that to then think about how are we saving this data? How are we saving what we're trying to store into the database? At the moment, my project, I've got it running on the simulator, and I save comic. My project has all of these fields that I want to save, as well as others that we will eventually be adding, uh, such as um, photo and scanning barcodes and all of that. But all of this data is going to be information that is grouped together in a sort of a JSON bundle. That's then when we took the detour to have that social networks JSON assessment thing. So we're going to get back to the project here. Let's get back to our code index.js. Go ahead and open up the JS file in your scripts folder index.js. here um, at approximately line 195 we had var db equals new pouch db with my comics so this was the most basic concept here about starting to save data to the database uh, and uh, we then played with creating a comic book, uh, s a couple of different ways here. So just to confirm this is still working as you last expect expected it, if you run this in the simulator or the device, remember you can use Google Chrome to check the data stored so far in the database. So I'm running this in the simulator. I'm going to hit F12 and go over to go over to my uh, application index db and and on pouch under pouch i've got uh, i can look at it by sequence so just to remind ourselves as we do this testing we want to look at the data in the database Perhaps one of the fastest ways is to uh, run the project in the simulator so that we can then go directly to Google Chrome and look at the stuff that way. We can look at the data saved in the device by running it on the device, but then we still have to turn on Google Chrome and go over to the remote uh, remote devices and all of that. We can still do it that way. But I sort of think it's going to be a little bit faster just to run this project in the simulator. We're in Chrome directly. We hit F12 and then we can look at the application data. So that's what I've done here. I've gone over to application and then I see index DB and inside of that pouch my comics. And inside of that, I can see by sequence, I've saved two comics to the database so far. And I can see by opening up that value, key 1, object 0, I see it in this um, JSON format. I see a key and a value pair, uh, something, colon, something. And uh, there's, the, there's the key, or sort of like the name of the field, then the colon, then the, then the data. In this case, Superman, comic number one, comic year 1940. Now, we've got then underscore ID. That was that unique one that all of these pouch objects must have. And I see it right here, example one. In my second entry to my database, I have example two. The ID is example two. So nothing else in my database can have that ID. We also see something that will be more important later on called underscore rev. 
for revision. PouchDB can keep track of the different changes to your data. And that's uh, marked right here. After these colons, it says 1 dash uh, a unique value. Example 2, 1 dash a unique value. So this is the first version of this data in my database. Unique ID, first version of the data. As we then uh, set ourselves up to change the entries, let's say, whoops, I misspelled Superman. I wrote Superb Man instead of Superman. I want to go back and change an entry in my data, in my database, so I'm going to update it, and then it'll say Rev 2 dash something. And that can be pretty, it can, for all intents and purposes, infinite, infinite number of changes. You know, technically, because I guess 32-bit 32 uh, 32 numbers and such, I guess there's like a 16 million changes. But you know, for all intents and purposes, infinite. So uh, we're, I've got one version of the data, and this rev will, will be important later. We're still putting, we're still figuring out and learning how do we put data in the database. In Visual Studio. That is evident in these screens right or in this code right here, where we created the database, and then I created a comic. I created an object called a comic, and then we've got the ID um, property, and then the value, example one, the comic name property, and then the value Superman, comic number property, and the value. You can I, I also often call them key and value pairs or property and value pairs. And we saw this when we worked on the social networks project. Um, key and value comma until the last one, no comma. All of that is in curly braces. All of this in this case is saved to this variable. And then right here we put the data into the into the database. All of this that we that we worked on a while ago um, was just to kind of try it out, test it out, it's working. But we need to set ourselves up in a much smarter way. Uh, this is just to show you. Here's Pouch. Here's how we save it. We put it into the database. But we need to care about uh, running the project and reading what's in those fields. So I think to make it the easiest, uh, I'm going to delete all of this and we're going to write it the right way. I just wanted to show this as a starting point. But if you've been saving a copy of your code from previous lessons, you have a copy of this. And I've got a copy of it in the network folder. So what I mean is all of this about create the database, all the way down to put two copies of a comic book in the database. We don't, we don't need that. We're going to do it better. You can comment it out if you don't want to lose it. You should know how to do that. Comment out your code if you want to. <clears throat> I'm going to recommend to delete it. In my case, it's from about line 194 to 225. If your numbers don't line up, obviously you need to pay attention to how your numbers are. But in my case, it's from the var db down to the get, db get. Like I said, I've got a copy of that back in the network folder, and I've got backups on my flash drive. If you're not comfortable deleting it, you will need to comment it out. And it's a lot to comment out because um, we're going to do this better. So I've simplified it back down to pouch code starts here, pouch code ends here, nothing. So we're going to start again. Okay, so because this project, I've already, you know, pulling back the curtain, I've already taught this project several times. I know how it should work, and I know where things often go wrong. 
imagine if you were starting this from scratch, you had this great idea to make this app. You would uh, either have to spend the time to kind of figure out all of the nuances of it before getting down to coding, or most likely you're going to figure out what you need to do as you're coding it. And so for example, okay, I want to start to save data to a database. So I know how to create a database. It's new PouchDB. Easy. But uh, oftentimes when you use an app, um, many apps have a way for you to start over. Right? You, you, let's say you've got a game. You've got a game and you've gotten to a certain point and you can't progress from it or you've gotten a high score you can't beat your high score. Um, uh, perhaps sometimes you need to delete your high score. You need to start over. So that high score, you need to put it back to zero. You need to start over. We want to have that feature in our project here. Perhaps a person wants to start over, delete their whole collection and start over. We will let them delete individual comics, of course. We will let them edit individual comics, of course. But sometimes someone just wants to start over. So we need to set up a mechanism to be able to create a database whenever we need to. Earlier when I had the code here, this created a database right now and and we're ready to use it, but we don't have a system to reuse it, so to speak. So what we're going to do is set up a way to uh, create a database whenever we want. And this is actually something we want to do early on in the code. If we set ourselves up here 195 lines after the beginning of the code, that will cause problems because of how JavaScript is read and processed from top to bottom, left to right. So we need to do some things uh, sort of like in different points when we're using the app. And one of the first things we need to do is create the database. We didn't know about this 195 lines ago when we were setting up the basic things about it, such as you know the form to create the account <coughs> and to sign in and all of that. I know about it, but I didn't tell you because it was too early to tell you. So my point here is we need to back up to the beginning of the document, to the beginning of our code, and set up PouchDB early on, actually. We need to back up to, we need to back up to right after this block of variables. Uh, let's say in my case it's line 45 but it's after this first block of variables after this note I guess before this note this is line 45 here we're going to create a function here called init db initialize database this is a reusable function to create or recreate a pouch database. Okay, so this, uh, this function in here will contain the code to uh, create the PouchDB database. And the point of doing it this way is that wherever uh, we want to, whenever we want to create or recreate a database, we can easily do so, um, which we will need to eventually when we set up the system. Let's delete the database and start over. So just so that we continue to do what we usually do. We've got a console output here that says something like uh, init initialize init db is running. If we see this in our console output, 
we know that at the very least our init db function is running. And those little things are what help you debug. Well, why isn't it doing what I what I expected? I wrote the code properly, it's just not doing it. Oftentimes, simply putting this sort of console and, and that never appears can help you debug. Oh, I'm not even running my init db. No wonder nothing's happening. I never ran my function. Okay, in here, this is where we're going to create the variable uh, for our database. We'll call it current db, current database. Because again, uh, when we use these apps, someone figured out these, these issues, and it just works. Well, we need to figure out the issues ourselves. And the issue that's going on here is, didn't I say that I wanted different people to have their own account? Didn't we set up a whole system for different people to log in with their own information? Therefore, different people need their own database. We could, I guess, conceivably put everyone's data in one database. I think that'd be too messy, too much trouble to figure out whose user data am I dealing with. We're going to have a database for the current user, uh, a different database for each user. Therefore, then they have their maximum amount of space uh, for their own data. So the current database is going to be uh, the name of the database is going to be based on who is currently logged in. Who is logged in is based on the local storage dot get item so we're, we're coming back to local storage to check who is the person currently logged in who is the person who is the person currently logged in So, in quotes, is logged in, So the, the database for the particular person is named for that person's email. So our note here, it's a big note, so I'll do the multi-line. Every user has their own database. And it's based, and it's named after their email address. Therefore, it's based on the current user logged in. Is logged in. I'm going to have my own database with my own collection. Janet is going to have her own database with her collection. Jim is going to have his own um, database with his collection. And they're all separated by being named. The database is going to be named 
based on who is logged in. And is logged in stores their email address. We set up this is logged in before. If you're curious, we set who is logged in based on the person's email address. So just for your information, line 160, 67. So we've been saving the person's email address in the is logged in local storage cookie. So we're using it again up here. We're going to create a database based on whoever is logged in, their email address. So next line. db equals new pouch db. This is where we had written my comics. Well, by putting the value here as a string, it's always that name of the database. I'm setting up a system for different people to have a different database, which is current db. No quotes. Make sure you do not put quotes here. We want no quotes because this is a variable that changes. If you put it in quotes, it becomes a string that does not change. So here we're checking who is currently logged in. Give me their email. Store it here. Let's create a new database in Pouch with that person's email. So therefore, everyone has their own email their own password, uh, their own um, database based on their email. We can say here, then create a new database with their email. The currently logged in user's email. Yes? Using DB, that's, we can do that because we installed PowerDB. Is that right? Or is that just something that we do with um, Yes, because we've got PouchDB. Um, earlier, remember back on the code that we deleted, we had uh, originally var db equals new PouchDB. So this, uh, this is anything. This is the name of uh, any variable that is storing the database. What we can do with PouchDB is this new PouchDB instant. This is the name of, this is the internal name of the database, which technically, because we deleted the code earlier, we need to write it again. We're going to do that in a moment. Uh, lastly, return DB. And the point here, we'll write return the database object to the global scope. So since we're inside of this function, we've created this these variables that they exist inside of this function. We've touched on before that we can have variables inside a function, outside a function. And the big difference is that variables that are inside of a function only exist in that function for as long as that function is running. Well, I want to return the database variable, the object, back to the global scope so we can reuse it anywhere <coughs> else in the app. So a variable like this, current DB, is a local scope um, object uh, which only exists and is only usable within the world of this function. Once this function stops running, we cannot access these variables. So we're returning that variable back to the global scope to be able to reuse it elsewhere in our project. So that we can use that object anywhere else in the app. So we can say up here, this is a local scope. Uh, 
object or variable that can only be used in this function as long as it's running. Current DB, we created the variable current DB in this function. It can only be used in this function as long as this function is running. So in order for it to make sense and be usable outside of the function, we return it. We, we pop it back out of this function to be able to use it elsewhere throughout our project. Well, if you do notice, technically, we are trying to use a variable that we haven't really created yet. I didn't say var db. That is, that is what you would expect. That's what we had um, on that code we deleted. But we don't want to create the variable here, actually. Uh, we want to create it outside of the function. Even though we're returning the 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 data back to the to the global scope uh, in the testing that we've done, it's better uh, that we have this that we create this variable outside. So let's put a pin on this. We're going to come back to it, um, and you know you you can put a little marker right here to remind yourself that's actually a breakpoint. But you can click right here to put a little pin right there to remind you to come back to it. You can just click on that edge right there, turn it on or off. I'm just going to put a little marker right there. You'll see it on your edge right there. You've got a marker. It's a break point for, for debugging. We can borrow that just to highlight it for a moment to remind us to come back here. Because I want to go back to the code uh, where we had that block about pouch, pouch DB code is here. It was back on line, line 195 or something. Yeah, right here. Now it's 215. var db create a see how should we say create a an uninitialized uninitialized uh, database object so to keep it all together our pouch code will all go right here. Creating the, creating the pouch object right here, but it hasn't been set up yet. The full setup, don't write this, but the full setup is new pouch db. Right, this is what we deleted earlier. And then we call this iComics. Yeah, don't write this. But this, this would have been, right, this would have been the instance of the database with this name that never changes. Well, the whole point of setting up that function earlier is so that the, the database name does change depending on who's logged in. So I don't want to actually set it to anything at the moment. I just want to create the object. It's uninitialized. It's undefined. Then back up at the top where we've got that, where we put that pin, that's where it will that's where it then says db equals new pouch db based on the person's email so create an uninitialized database object in the global scope so this can be used anywhere in our code in any function anywhere it's global it's been defined outside of a function it can be used anywhere So I'm going to go back to where I put my breakpoint. And you want to remember to turn these off, actually, because when you debug, your code will stop at that point. The point of that little marker, that breakpoint, is to break the code, to stop the code at that point, to debug it. Um, I'm just using it as a, a little reminder to come back here. You want to turn this off. 
You want to turn this off unless you're using it for the intended purpose and you know how to use it for that purpose, which we've never talked about. So I would say turn it off. But I went back to, in my case, line 59. Now that's where it says db equals new pouch db based on the current user's email. <coughs> Return the value of that variable back to the global scope so we can use it elsewhere. So this init db function is what we can use to create uh, the database for the first time or subsequent times. When eventually we set up the system to delete the database, we want to recreate a database. So we just have to run init db. But technically, we have not run init db the first time yet. We've created the function init db, but we haven't actually said, OK, create the database. We've set up a mechanism to create a database, but we haven't said run init db to actually create the database. But we're going to do that after the person logs in. There's no point in trying to create a database before a person has created an account, before a person has logged in. We don't know what database, what to call the database until they sign up and log in. All of that happens right here. Line 73 or so, here's where we check. Is there a person logged in? No, there's no user logged in. Or else, yes, there is a user logged in. Here's where we check. Is there a person logged in? Has an account been created? No. OK, do nothing right here. Do nothing. Um, is there a person that is logged in? Yes. OK, take them to the PG home. And if there is a person logged in, well, that's when we initialize the database. On line 78, make a new line 78 right here. A person is logged in. Therefore, initialize the database init db function the code that we deleted earlier today had it all in one place create the variable initialize the database call it this my comics or whatever and it was done but that's not what we needed because we need more complexity. We need to have a different database for a different user. So we created that function that we can reuse. We're basing the, uh, the database on the person's email. Well, we, we, um, we check who's logged in in this if-else block right here. And therefore, we can run the function and create the database. Just to test this out, go ahead and save it. And you can run it in the simulator. Actually, before you run it, why not also do this? View error list, just in case. Check if you've got any errors here. After this amount of typing, remember, uh, view menu error list. Check if you've got any errors. If not, good. If yes, we'll fix it in a moment. I don't seem to have errors, so I'm going to run this on my simulator. I'm going to go to my developer's console. I'm going to go look at the application viewer to the database, and let's see what I have. So this automatically logged me in F12. If I go look at my applications, I have Pouch My Comics, which was from earlier in the day, and I've got a new database, v at v.com. I've got a new database based on the last person logged in, v at v.com. When I click in there, by sequence, there's nothing because I haven't saved anything to the database yet. But to test this, I'm going to log out. 
I'm going to sign up with a brand new account. John at smith.com, password, join, log in, John at smith.com, password, uh, refresh my databases here, new database, pouch, John at smith.com. So you should be seeing that it is dynamically creating different databases for different users not just the the default one from earlier in the day that one that was hard coded you should be seeing that you get new databases for every new user you may have to refresh the browser to see it but you should be able to see as you log out and sign up with new accounts you get new databases cat catatdog.com log in catatdog.com refresh I've got a new database which is empty <coughs> but I'm creating database so let's pause here uh, raise your hand if that worked okay good if not let's do a little pause right here uh, let me back up to the relevant most important code, it's right here, the initialize db. If anyone needs any help, call me.
So this function here, what it's doing is it's setting ourselves up to be able to create a database whenever we need it or access a currently existing database. Uh, so the very first time, if you think about it logically, uh, when I run the project for the very first time, there's no database because there's no user. Subsequent times after I create an account and it automatically logs me in, that's where I'm seeing the um, that's where I'm seeming the output here on the console. InitDB is running. So okay, InitDB is trying to run, and then I can confirm that in the application I've got the account. Okay, so we've got a database now that uh, where, where we can start to save the data. And we've got a way that uh, whoever is logged in has their own database. Depending on the browser and the device, the user has somewhere between 5 megabytes and up of storage. Now remember, a database is really just text. So 5 megabytes of text is a lot of text. It's not that the picture is saved in the database. It's that there's a path to the photo on the memory card in the database. So 5 megabytes, at least, per user is enough space. And if more is necessary, the system can allocate more. So we have all of this amount of space for every user. And I've got these, uh, these three users so far, and the database is based on their email address. 
Now, because we're in debug mode, because we're in Visual Studio, running it in debug, we're able to see all of this. We're able to use Chrome and spy behind the scenes and all of that. But eventually, when we uh, actually change this to our final release mode later, it will be compressed and obfuscated and encrypted and all of that, so we will not be able, you know, no one will be able to load your app in Visual Studio and see that. It's going to be compressed, encrypted, and all of that. It's just that it's very open right now in debug mode. So yeah, we're seeing the password totally open, open <coughs> text. We're seeing the database totally open and raw code. But that's because we're in debug mode, and it will have encryption once we go to release mode. Um, OK, so next what we've got to start to do is, if we've got a database system, uh, we're going to start saving the uh, the important information. Let me just uh, zoom out again here. And line 79, obviously a while ago we didn't have that line, we didn't need it. But now it's a very important that we have that on line 79. OK, we've checked. Is a person not logged in? Do nothing. Is a person logged in? Yes. Initialize the database. You know, note that they're logged in. Grab their email. Change us to the home screen. Now, that's very important. And a while ago, we could not set that up because we needed to learn all about Pouch and JSON and setting up all of that stuff. But now we've got that. So now it's about setting up our code to start to capture what the person is writing in those input fields. We've got, it, we've got an area where we can start to save the data to the database. Now it's all about capturing these fields, bundling them together, and putting them into the database. Let's get back to the part of the code in the JavaScript where we were going to write all of our Java, all of our pouch code line 200 something, 215, 218. Let's go back to that chunk, line 218-ish. Here's where we need to create a variety of objects based on that form. We've had experience in this before, so this should, this should look familiar. So here's what we need to do first. Uh, we'll do here create variables or objects based on the save comic form. That whole save comic screen is a big old form. We need a variable. We'll do this via jQuery. So $l element form save comic is equal to the jQuery selector. We need to go find an ID. We need to find an ID of the form tag and save it as our jQuery based variable. And just to confirm that name, it's probably save comic FM save comic. What do we call it? Form save comic? Yeah, form save comic. So the ID of that input form is pound form save comic. That's the ID for the whole form. There are all of these input fields in this form. We need to read what's in all of them. But we only need to read what's in, in all of them the moment the person clicks Submit. So if we were to create variables right now of all of those input forms, that wouldn't do us any good. There's nothing in those input form fields at the moment. 
we have to read what's in those inputs when the person clicks submit. But we've created an object of the whole form so that then when the person clicks submit, then we'll read what's inside of them. So we'll set up an L form save comic dot submit event listener. Event listener when a person clicks submit in the save comic form. All right, so after the person clicks submit, we'll run a function. There's some form when someone submits, run a function. Make sure you've got your syntax here, anonymous function, parentheses, curly braces, uh, inside of that, inside of those parentheses where we're capturing an event on the event of the person clicking submit. Because this is going to be, again, the issue that we dealt with a while ago. Here is a, a sign-up form. A person is creating an account. It's a sign-up form. The default behavior of a form in HTML is to refresh the screen. We didn't want that. We wanted the person to sign up and a little pop-up that says, OK, great, log in. We needed to change the default behavior. Same thing here. The default behavior of submitting a form is to refresh the screen. I don't want that. I want to capture what's inside of those fields and do other stuff. So we're setting ourselves up the same way as before to uh, change the default behavior here. And we're running a function, and we will call this fn function save comic. This is going to run a function with that event so that we can prevent the default behavior. And yes, I've got this extra semicolon here uh, because this will pop up a, a warning in our error panel. It'll say uh, missing semicolon. <coughs> two semicolons on one line. What does that mean? Why do we have two semicolons? We never have two semicolons on one line. Why? One of you is right, yes, yes. Because when we separate this into multiple lines, it's obvious that there's a semicolon there. So you can keep it on one line or multiple lines like me. Uh, I'm going to keep it on the same line. But that's why we've got an extra semicolon there, because technically we're saying, um, here's an anonymous function from here to here. There's code between those curly braces, technically separate lines of code, so therefore end of line on those. And then it ends my submit method. So we, I mentioned that before. And again, just to see it, if you separate it like that, it's obvious then that it needs a semicolon at the end of that line. OK, well, this is calling a function that doesn't exist yet. Let's back up here. And define it. Function fn save comic. And fn save comic. Uh, that we're passing an event into it. So, as we've done several times, we've created the object representing the form. We've created an event listener. Listen for the person to submit. Once they've submitted, run a function. There's the function. And the first thing we want to do here, because we're dealing with a form, a plain old classic uh, HTML 1.0 form, we then need to event prevent default. I don't want the default behavior of refreshing the screen. I need to capture what's written. In, in those fields and save it to the database and do stuff. I don't want to refresh. I want to manually control that. So we've seen this before. And just for the notes, 
prevent the default form behavior of <laughs> behavior of um, refreshing the screen, basically. And just to make sure this is working, console log fn save comic is running. So at the very least, you can test it here. Uh, check your console. Go to the go to the screen where you're going to save the comic. Press the button. At the very least, you then should see some feedback in your console that says the function is running. It's not running correctly yet. It's not complete yet. But at the very least, we should see the behavior that pressing that Save button in the Save Comic screen should give you some feedback. It should give you function is running. Go ahead and save it and run it and check that. Run it and check that it that you see that output when you click save. So let me do a quick test here. I'm going to run it in my browser. No errors, except that fav icon. Don't worry. Uh, save comic. You don't have to type anything. Save. Actually, you have to type something to prevent the required fields. Save save comic function is running. So you should see that at the least. The screen should not refresh itself. It should not kick you back to the welcome screen. You should just stay right there and you should see that it says on line 225 or so it is saying the function is running. Okay, so again, with with 2020 hindsight, I know what we need to do here. But logically, you tell me what what do you think we need to do next? If we know that the submit button is working, well, what do we need to do next? Capture, Capture those inputs. Capture the data in the inputs. Yes. Let's stop right there. Um, we have an idea of what this project should do, how it should behave, what it should look like, and such. But again, if you take yourself outside of the role as a developer for a moment and think in terms of the user. Okay, I'm a regular old person. I downloaded this amazing new app I just heard of, CBDB. I want to store my comics there. There's this great app. Okay, I downloaded it. I get to this point in the app, and I'm going to start to save stuff in here. I'm going to save my comic. Great. So it seems to be designed and well enough to tell the person or to explain to the person when they reach to this point that yeah I should be able to um, fill in these boxes and such um, so I would type in right spider-man and all of that uh, and whoops my finger slipped and then I'm gonna type a number over here and then the year and I'm gonna type the rest and I'm gonna click Save did you notice my finger slipped? This comma in the title might not be um, the name that I want to save. At the moment, this input field will accept anything you want to write here. It will accept anything you want to write here. You might not want special characters and symbols and such. 
and we did set the number input field that it should only accept numbers. I'm trying to type letters, and it does not allow letters. Well, that's good. Um, but what if I want to exclude certain characters from that input? So I need to program it to do that. And let's also talk about this. Let's say once I've saved all of these comics, I'm going to be able to retrieve them, and I can retrieve them in various ways. One basic way is alphabetical. It'll show me all of the Superman comics, Spider-Man comics, Wonder Woman comics, alphabetically. So if I've saved the Spider-Man comic, um, let's say I save, I save Wonder Woman first. OK, save that first. Then I save Spider-Man. Well, alphabetically, W comes after S. So no problem. When I retrieve it alphabetically, it'll retrieve like that. But what if there's a, a comic called The Spider-Man? It's going to take into account the T in the name here. And usually, when you deal with organization of names and things, isn't the excluded? Isn't usually something something like Spider-Man, comma, the? Doesn't it alphabetize in a way ignoring that particular article of English? Uh, what's that called? Preposition, synonym, what's that thing called? What's the the called? Article. Article, OK, great. The article, the, in Spider-Man would often be ignored. Um, oftentimes, a. Uh. Isn't that often ignored? What are perhaps other articles that are ignored alphabetically? And? What's that? N. N, yeah, that one could be ignored as well. So what I'm getting at is that this can accept any input, even inputs that might be sort of wrong, especially for like alphabetization. The Spider-Man should be ignoring the. <clears throat> N, amazing. Superman number one should be ignoring N. Uh, so we need to capture the data here in a smarter way. We need to process the input to how we want it. To ignore those the those those articles that that will hinder us. So actually, before we start to set up our code here. To save comic, we need to prepare the data we're about to capture. Save comic's role is to save the data to the database. I want to prepare the data first. I want to exclude certain characters. Um, I want to prepare. I want to massage the data so that it's uh, good before I store it into the database. So before saving a comic, Let's create a new function called fn prep comic. Because the, the goal, the purpose of this function here, function to save the comic data to the database. That's its purpose, to save. And we want first a function to prepare the data. Function to prepare the data, the comic data, before saving to the database. This is where I can exclude words and ignore exclamation points. Because when you alphabetize, computers also alphabetize by symbols. So the slash, the exclamation point, and commas, computers use those as a way to alphabetize as well. And different systems alphabetize in different ways. So we're going to just ignore all of that and just deal with letters, plain old letters and numbers. We can alphabetize that easily.
one more thing before that. Function to check the first word of the comic name. Okay, so I thought, okay, great, I'm just going to capture the data and save it, the end. No, we have to do things beforehand to get us to that point. And again, when you use an app that's already been made, someone figured that out. Someone debugged that. Someone sweated over that to hopefully create an app that, that just works. Us, that we're starting from zero, well, I already, I already know where we're going, but if you were doing this from scratch, you'd be figuring this out. Oh, it's working great. Oh, but wait a minute, it's organizing things alphabetically wrong. It's taking into account the, I don't want that, so oh, now I've got to go back and make a function or make a system to exclude those words. So here's a function that is first going to check, is it a the, is it an an, is it, a, is it an a, or whatever we define as words to ignore. We'll write this, then we'll take a break. Um, this is what we'll, we'll, what we'll check on the first word. And this, uh, this is going to check the string. The, the word that we're putting into that we're trying to capture. So we'll do if else <coughs> this is and if else checking which Uh, function if else uh, for getting the first word. Wait, what are we checking? Uh, okay, end if end of if else uh, if the word if the name of the comic is single word or not. So that's another thing. I might have the amazing Spider-Man, number one. Okay, the amazing Spider-Man, three words. There are comics that are just named one word, Superman. There's no first or second word, it, there's just <coughs> one, one word. So right here we need to check, does the comic have more than one word? In the if, we're going to say str.index of make sure that's a capital O quote space quote make sure there's a space right there I'll explain what this is in a moment but further we're then saying triple equals negative one the idea is we're going to capture the name of the comic and it might be called the amazing spider-man or maybe called superman the name of the comic is going to be stored in this string and we're checking uh, to see where is the first index or instance of an empty space so don't write this but if we had the amazing spider-man there is a space right there Remember, spaces are not nothing. Spaces do take up a space in memory. So what this is saying up here is, let's find the first instance of an empty space. Now, if it was just Superman, there, there is no empty space. It's just the name of the comic right here. There's no empty space. All of this is basically check, is checking. Is there an empty space after the first word. We're saying if there is an empty space
sorry, if there is not an empty space, this is a one word title. Nothing console log a one word title and return string. So all of this is checking. Is the is the comic a one word title or not? It's basically all that this is saying. Um, that negative one. Just sort of like, trust me on that. That's what this is saying. Um, this first part, if uh, there is no empty space, this is a one word title. That's what all of this if is doing right here. Otherwise, over here, um, there is an empty space, therefore, multi word title. extract that first word. And the whole point of this is, this is how I'm trying to check. Is the very first word the, or an, or a, those words that we're going to forget about? Superman is simply Superman. So right there we just return it. OK, it's called Superman. That's it. Don't do anything. Or else it's called the space Amazing Spider-Man. There is a space. Then we jump, we drop into else. So what we're returning is a modified version of this string. Extract the first word. Substring, S, S U B S T R, substring. We're going to extract something from this text. This text is holding the name of the comic. If we're in the else part, it must be something like The Amazing Spider-Man or An Amazing Spider-Man. It must be some word space something. We're going we're gonna to create a substring of what is that first word. Starting from the zero width position. And then right here, just for, for fun, it says, uh, substring gets a substring beginning at the specified location and having the specified length. Length is a number of characters. Start from the zeroth position. If it's the, it's the t. Start from the first, the zeroth position, and then go far enough to to capture what that length is. Which again we'll say uh, string dot index of parentheses. Quotes with a space. I did not. Thank you. Index. And it's the, it's the same as what I've got up there. OK, so let's return the first word. Start from the zeroth letter and go x amount of spaces until we get to the empty space. So look, think about it like this, name of. We start from the zero, which is n, and keep going until we see the first instance of an empty space. So it would capture the word name. It would capture name and return it so that we can use it elsewhere. Up here, it would be if, if we have typed in only name. The name of the comic is name. There's no space. They just type name. So it would just capture name. It would return name. It's a one-word title or else it must at least have more than one word. It's not smart enough yet to check. Is it the, is it an, is it if, is it or? It's just checking. Does the name of this comic have more than one word? If we get over to else, yes. There is something called comic is single. That's the name of my comic. Comic is single. There is something, space, something, space. That's what that's checking up there. So it would go this far here. Start from zero. See, keep going until we find the first space, capture that much, return that much. We 
can do uh, before that console log a multi word title. And uh, we'll take a break here. We can't quite test it if this works yet. We're not actually running this function anywhere yet. We're still setting ourselves up. Again, that seems like a lot of effort. And honestly, it is, because software is a lot of effort. Things that seem to just work is because someone spent hours and days and weeks to get it to work, or a team of people. Even as something as simple as, what is the very first word of the comic? Well, here's one function that is going to extract that first word. Next, after this, we need to then prepare that. We need to say, OK, is it the? Ignore it. Is it a? Ignore it. Is it mighty from Mighty Mouse? Don't ignore it. So we still need to further prepare the name of the comic. Then finally, eventually, we save the comic to the database. And yeah, it's a lot of steps in the beginning. But once we figure out the algorithm, once we figure out the steps, and it works. It just works now and forever. But the first time figuring out the algorithm is the tricky part. And like I said, I've taught this class several years, and this will work. And it, you know, it might seem a little weird at the moment, but as we uh, use it, it should come together. Um, so I'm going to save my code to the network folder. Let's take a break at 7:50. Take a break until. We'll do 8:05. We took a long one this time. We'll take a break until 8:05, and then we'll go on.